morning, everyone. So glad to see each of you. I do welcome you to Calvary Bible Church. Let's look at John chapter 2, and I'll begin reading verse 13. Prepare our hearts for the message from God's Word. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Let's uh, join our hearts together in a prayer, Um, a passage that the Lord encouraged me with this week was uh, Psalm 40. So I'll be reflecting some of those words as uh, we lift up our hearts together to the Lord. Our Father, we are thankful to be uh, in your presence today under the hearing, instruction, and encouragement of the Word of God. Lord, our souls and hearts truly wait for you. We rest in you. Thank you that you hear our cry. Thank you that your spirit helps us in our weaknesses, even when we don't know exactly how to pray. Lord, thank you that our testimony of grace in Jesus Christ is that you drew each of us out of the pit of destruction. Thank you that you delivered us out of the miry bog and you set our feet on the rock, and that rock is Jesus You're our anchor. You are steadfast. We are secure in you by your grace. Lord, we gaze to you when the world around us seems to be going crazy. Lord, we know that you sit enthroned above the heavens. And Lord, you do whatever you please. Father, we find encouragement that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, that he turns it wherever direction he desires. And so, Lord, we are trusting in you. We are resting in you. Lord, help us to be people that trust you and that believe in you. We ask your forgiveness for our doubt and our unbelief and our complaining spirit and our our murmuring. Lord, uh, we know that you're in control You tell us to give thanks in all things, and so, Lord, we want to submit to you and have a a thankful heart today and to rest in you. Father, we pray that today, as the word of God is preached, you would build in us an utmost confidence in you and your word of grace. We recognize that your steadfast love and your faithfulness and your mercy is what preserves your people. We realize that not only are you sovereign and you're perfect in wisdom, but you are such a kind and good and loving God that you even know the details of our lives down to the number of hairs on our head. Lord, our hearts fail us, but you are our strength. You are our portion. Lord, strengthen us by your word today. I pray for Pastor Zaspel that you would strengthen him as he delivers the word of God to our hearts, to our minds, 
and may we leave changed people in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, it is a delight to be with you, and for several reasons. One in particular, I told the people who were here in the earlier service that in a very real sense, I am indebted to this church for my wife. My wife, Kim, grew up here. Kim Barrows was her name then, uh, but her mother was um, living here, and they were living here in the area just down the street from the church, and her sister would come and visit in Columbus and always witness to her, try to uh, bring the gospel to her, and she had none of that. Uh, but through various circumstances, she realized she did need it, and this is then where she came. Her sister would attend here on Sundays when she visited. This is back in the early 60s. And uh, so when uh, Betty needed help, this is where she came. Pastor Ashbrook, Ashbrook uh, led her to Christ, and the uh, family came here. Kim first heard the gospel in this place, and so I'm very grateful for this church. Because of that, I've always had a, an interest in the church. We've kind of kept an eye on it over the years as we come back to Columbus to visit. And uh, it's been a number of years now since her parents lived here. Um, but we always did during those days. And then a few years ago, we were here to visit and became acquainted with Pastor Eric. Just delighted that he is here. Delighted to see the congregation thriving. Delighted that he is the pastor. I've listened to some of his preaching. Now I've talked to him as well. And I just am very happy that he's here for this congregation. You are a blessed congregation indeed to have him. And uh, I'm delighted to be here and to enrich the acquaintance with Pastor Eric as well. If you will, please take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2 passage that was just read. It would be difficult, I think, to find a portrait of Jesus that is more incorrect, politically incorrect, or at least more unlike our usual images of Jesus that come to mind when we think of him in the days of his earthly ministry. It's just a fascinating scene when we see Jesus. He's walking to the temple. He sees the trading that's going on in the temple. He becomes angry, he stops, he takes some uh, plants together, weaves together a whip, comes into the courtyards of the temple and starts driving men out. He is shouting at them, don't make my father's house a house of trade. He is whipping the men, he's no doubt whipping the animals, driving them out, he overturns the tables, which really must have angered them. He emptied the money boxes. You can see the money rolling across the courtyard. It's a fascinating picture of Jesus. I doubt it's the kind of picture that usually comes to your mind when you think of Jesus in the days of his earthly ministry. And I think what's particularly fascinating about it is that he pulls it off. It's fascinating that no one jumps him. They don't have him ar arrested. A whip is... <laughs> It's not like it's an Uzi. It's not that formidable of a weapon. They could have jumped him, but they didn't. He pulls it off. He comes in. He exercises authority, even discipline over the people who are in charge of the uh, precincts of the temple, and out they go. Again, it's just a, an unusual picture of Jesus and not what we typically think of him. And in fact, this is not the last time he does this. There's a second cleansing of the temple in the last week of his ministry, just before his death, where he does it again. Well, it's Passover, and so he's coming to the temple. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, you can find there that there were, there were three major feasts in Israel in which the faithful were called to Jerusalem to celebrate and offer sacrifice and offer worship. Passover was one of those. And Jesus comes then for this Passover celebration, and he finds that the temple has been turned into a, a marketplace, what he calls it here, a house of trade. Now, on a later occasion when he cleanses the temple, he accuses the people involved of being thieves, overcharging, price gouging, something like that. That may have been involved here, but that's not the point here. 
The point here is just that it had become a place of trade. It's the trading itself that upsets Jesus. People had come from afar. They are coming to uh, offer animals in sacrifice. Many of them would not have had those animals. They would have to purchase them. Some may have had them at home, but it was too far to travel with the animals, so they want to purchase one when they're there. And so there's these trading opportunities to purchase the animals. You want to contribute money to the temple treasury. You can't put pagan money in the temple treasury, and so there has to be a currency exchange. That service is there as well. There's a sense in which all of these services that are being offered are in one, at one level very appropriate and very needed. The problem, as Jesus saw it, was the inappropriateness of that kind of activity within the precincts of the temple itself. Now, why that upset Jesus? We have to back up and understand the significance of the temple itself. I think too often that we, at this point in history, when we think of the old temple, we tend more or less to equate it with our church building. It's a place where you go to worship. And there really just is virtually no comparison the Old Testament temple was not just a building where people went to worship. The significance of the Old Testament temple was that it was the dwelling place of God. It was the place of his residence. You remember there's the outer courts, and then there's this inner building with two rooms, and then the first room is the holy place, and then there's the curtain. Beyond that, there's the most holy place where there's the mercy seat, and the high priest would go in there just once a year. That mercy seat is the throne of God. That holy place was the throne room of God, the place of his residence. And that rendered the temple a holy place. This is genuinely sacred space. This is the place of God's presence. Because it's the place of God's presence, it's also the place of meeting with God. If you want to meet with God, you go to the temple. That's where he is. That's where he manifests his presence. Now, of course, to meet with God, you have to meet, through him through, to meet with him through the mediation of priests and sacrifices and so on. And we'll see more of that as we go along. But this was a sacred place. This is where God was. This is where you meet with God if you would meet with him at all. And because it's a sacred place, it also has become a place of prayer. There's a mention in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 56, where God calls his house the house of prayer. My house shall be the house of prayer. And Jesus, of course, alludes to that here. Well, Jesus comes to the temple, and rather than hearing the mumbling sounds of the prayers of the faithful, he hears merchants jockeying for the best price and for the most business. Buy your pigeons over here. Buy a lamb here. We've got better prices here. We've got a better price on the exchange for your currency here. And the dwelling place of God, the place where you meet with God, this sacred space had been reduced to a place of commercial enterprise, a place that has become now a place for personal financial profit commercial gain. And Jesus couldn't bear it. He's seen in all this. He is upset. His house, God's house, has been turned into a marketplace, and he's just unable to sit by silently. And so verse 17 tells us, because of his zeal for the house of God, he was enraged at the people. And as I say, he didn't he didn't fly off the handle. He is, this is not a temper tantrum. He's very calculated about it. In principle, he's upset with what's going on because the house of God, the place of his presence, has been reduced to something so profane. And so he makes the whip and he drives them out. Amazing scene. Well, we have to ask then, what's the point? And I think the first answer to that is, in the big picture of things, we have to see here the corruption of Israel itself. We see many times in Jesus' ministry hints that God was taking the kingdom from Israel and turning, from the, to, turning to the Gentiles. This is one of those passages. 
Israel had been corrupt, become corrupt in its worship. There's a perfunctory performance of her acts of worship. They're still going to the temple. They're still offering the sacrifices and all of that. But yet it's just a perfunctory thing because here's an opportunity for us to make money. You have to think the priests are involved and Levites, they get their cut on it. And the concern is not the worship and the presence of God. The concern is what can we make out of this? And Jesus is upset with it. This is symbolic of the whole corruption of Israel itself and it's turning from a sincere worship of God and in Jesus driving out these money changers from the temple, we see in the bigger picture, God turning from Israel herself. There are also here some fascinating, I think, fascinating observations about Jesus himself. Again, back to this idea of how you normally envisage Jesus when you think about him in the days of his earthly life. That picture, I think it's Solomon's portrait of Christ that is so common. One of the complaints I've always had about that, there are, there are more, but one of the complaints I've had about that famous picture is it tends to make him a little look a little effeminate. You sure don't get that here. We see something of Jesus' manliness here. His courage, this, again, the whip is not that formidable of a weapon. And so you see something of his manliness. You see something of his moral courage. Something had to be done. I'll do it. Moral courage. You see something also of his zeal for God. That is what's mentioned for us in verse 17. It's out of a sincere zeal for God that he was angry. This was not self-centered, selfish, wishing he could have the prophet himself kind of thing. But he's angry because God has been insulted. And it is his zeal for God that angers him and drives him to do all of this. I think actually there's a little more involved here in this. The zeal for your house will consume consume me, verse 17. That is an allusion back to Psalm 69 where David's zeal for house, uh, God's house consumed him. And here it consumes Jesus And we have just a glimpse of the cross. It was his zeal for God that ultimately consumed him in a very literal way. We see something here of the anger of Jesus. Here is a righteous anger. There is such a thing as righteous anger. And there is a time when not to be angry is a fault. And we learn here from Jesus as a revelation of God himself, what angers God? And this kind of sham worship and turning the worship of God into something for personal profit, it angered Jesus and we may know then by extension, it angers God himself as well. More to the point of all of this and narrowing it to the discussion that follows, we see something here of Jesus' own self-assessment. Now this is enormously important in this passage and in a hundred other passages as you read through the Gospels. Jesus here tells us something by implication of what he thought of himself. He is behaving here as someone who has authority over the temple and over the temple precincts. That he has the authority not only to criticize but to correct and to enforce that corrective with a whip. He is behaving as someone who has authority. And in fact, that's the question that's going to follow that we'll see in a moment. Who do you think you are? In fact, he says here, don't make my father's house a house of trade. Well, who is he to call him his father's house? I try to remind our people at our congregation of this often, that when you read through the Gospels, you need to keep this question before your mind. Who does he think he is? No, seriously. Who does Jesus think he is to behave like this? What kind of authority? What is his self-assessment 
to start calling it my father's house and to say that he has the authority to drive people out and, and issue correctives and so on. And we see this often in the Gospels that Jesus will not only say that he is the fulfillment of Scripture and Jesus uh, that Moses wrote of me or before Abraham was, I am, or he will send his angels in judgment, or he will raise the dead, or that you must honor him just as you honor the Father. You find statements like this all through the Gospels. No one knows the Father except the Son. And you have to ask, who does he think he is? Really? And that's the point of the discussion that follows in verses 18 and following. It's the high point of the passage, and it's what John intends to drive us to. In verse 18, the Jewish leaders inquire, what sign do you show us for doing these things? That is, by what authority do you do this? Who do you think you are? And if you think you have this kind of authority, give us a sign that demonstrates on one level, that <laughs> seems like an appropriate question, doesn't it? And that's exactly the question. Who is he to exercise this kind of authority? Well, they ask that question, but what's important to notice is that they have already implicitly acknowledged that Jesus was right in his assessment of them. We know that because they are not addressing him as a rabble rouser, as a vandal, or a terrorist, or a hooligan. If that were the case, if they had thought Jesus was a vandal and a hooligan, they'd have jumped him, they'd have been done with it, or they at least would have had him arrested. Plenty of laws on the books to prohibit that kind of activity, if that is what it was. But they didn't do that. And as much as they dislike Jesus at this, this point for what he has done, they know that he's not just acting like some kind of vandal. He's behaving like someone who has authority. The authority to exercise discipline even over the priests. And so they're interested in this question of authority. By what right do you do this? Show us a sign. What's missing, of course, is any kind of self-examination. No consideration that Jesus was right in his assessment of them. No willingness to consider that his assessment of them was just. Now, in their heart of hearts, they knew that Jesus was right. We know that because they didn't have him arrested. And they didn't jump him for it. And the whole issue there is that Jesus had their conscience on his side. And he uses it to his advantage. Well, they know he's right. But that doesn't mean that they're going to own up to it. And so they raise the question of authority. Who do you think you are? By what sign? Show us a sign that shows that you have this kind of authority. Who are you to call this your father's house? And what they're doing, of course, is pulling rank. Show us a sign. They're wanting to put Jesus in his place. They're wanting to domesticate him a little bit. Show us a sign, and then we will evaluate it. We will. And we will render our judgment, and we will let you know we will. Show us a sign, and we'll determine whether you have the authority to do this or not. Of course, it's a slick move, because however they answer now, they're left in charge. And with that request, Jesus just won't comply. He will not have them standing in judgment over him. And the irony, of course, is that if Jesus is who he seems to be in this kind of behavior, then they have no right to stand in judgment over him at all. He is their judge. And that's how he is behaving himself. 
This is just like in the Synoptic Gospels when, again, they asked Jesus for a sign, and he said, it's a wicked generation that wants a sign. I'm not going to give you a sign. I'll give you this sign. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. But again, they wanted a sign so that they could control the situation, put Jesus in his place. And with that, Jesus just won't comply. He will not give them a sign that they can control. He won't subject himself to them. But notice their specific question in verse 18. What sign do you show us for doing these things? Now, on the surface, at least, it seems that Jesus does comply. Verse 19, it's just staggering what he says. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. And verse 20, they are just shocked. It took 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? Now, we're clued in in verses 21 and 22 that Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. His body is that temple. Destroy this temple, this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But, of course, they didn't catch that, and how could they have? Even the disciples didn't catch on to that until after the resurrection. John tells us they looked back, okay, we get it. Now they believe the scriptures and Jesus' word. But they didn't get that, and you can hardly blame them. How else are they supposed to understand it? Jesus is standing at the temple. Give us a sign. He just cleansed the place. And they give us a sign of your authority. All right, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Of course they think it's the building he's talking about. They didn't believe that Jesus could build, re, re-erect the building in three days. <laughs> They're hardly going to call this bluff. They're not going to tear the place down and three days later say, see, you couldn't, and they don't have a temple. So they're an impasse. What do we do? On one level, Jesus did give them what they asked for. He offered, the, he gave them a sign, but it was not a sign that they could control. And they are left with this impasse. And yet, and yet, and this is the irony here. It was a sign that he eventually did give them. They destroyed his body, and in three days he raised it up. Now again, we find here the question that I was mentioning earlier. Who does he think he is? Who talks like this? Destroy this temple. In three days I'll raise it up. One, he calls himself the temple, But even if he had done it in a literal fashion, destroy this body in three days, I'll raise Who talks like that? I suppose there's some sense in which we could predict our own death if we're willing to make it happen, but that's not what happened here. And Jesus not only predicts his death, that they will do it, but he predicts that he will be raised from the dead again. And not only does he say that he will die and be raised, he gives the timing of it. Three days, I'll raise it up. Who does that? Now, if you could do, say that and pull it off, that'd be a sign of authority. And the irony is that they themselves would become the means of bringing about the sign that they demanded. They destroyed his body. And in three days when he raised it up, they still would not believe. But again... Jesus' language here is highly symbolic. On one level, as I've said several times here already, which is very obvious because John clues us into it in verses 21 and 22, on one level, he's simply speaking of his death and resurrection, something even the disciples themselves did not discern until later. So he's talking about his death and resurrection. But notice he does not say, destroy this body, and in three days I'll raise it up. What he says is, 
destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What's that all about? Well, again, obviously it's heavily symbolic and actually I think the symbolism is layered. And let's work our way through it in three steps. First of all, what Jesus is saying is he is the true temple. Destroy this temple. He is the true temple. Now that's something we actually already know back in John chapter 1. In John 1, you remember the apostle introduces Jesus as the word of God, the self-revelation of God. And all through verses 1 to 18, we are clued in to the rest of the gospel and understand that as we watch Jesus and we see his behavior and we listen to him speak, we need to understand this is God speaking. This is God making himself known in all that he says and all that he does and however he behaves. This is God making himself known. He is the word of God. He's God speaking. And he tells us in verses 1 to 3, he's in eternal fellowship with the Father. For eternity, he is with the Father. The elements of Trinitarian theology in the first three verses, he's the one who created all things. And then we get to verse 14, and it's a fascinating statement. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. This is the incarnation. This eternal word who has been with God and this one who is God from all eternity now has become flesh, the incarnation. This is God making himself known. But the language that John uses in verse 14 is really strange. The word became flesh and dwelt. You remember that word in the Old Testament, the dwelling place? That's the the Greek term here is that reflecting the Hebrew the tabernacle, we could translate it this way, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's just not the way people usually speak. What's he saying? He's saying what that old tabernacle was, Jesus is. That was the dwelling place of God, he is the dwelling place of God. It's another allusion to Jesus' deity. And so when Jesus says, I destroy this temple, He's just confirming that, that we saw already in chapter 1 and verse 14. But he goes further than that. If he is the true temple, then secondly, he is the true meeting place of God with men. Now this is the way Jesus taught us to read the Old Testament all the time. He is the serpent on the pole. He is the lamb that is offered. He is the manna. He's the Passover. He's the Sabbath. We see this kind of thing all through Jesus' uh, ministry where he takes Old Testament institutions and concepts, refers them to himself and says, they're all prospective. They all point to me. He is the ultimate fulfiller, fulfiller of them all. Here it's the same, only it's specifically with regard to the temple And the temple as a meeting place. The temple, the place of God's dwelling, and therefore the place where men meet with God is the temple. Or now, the temple, the meeting place with God, is Jesus. So Jesus is the true temple. Jesus is the meeting place with God. And that then takes us to what is the point of the passage, this third layer of it, and that is, it is Jesus' death and resurrection that constitute him as the true meeting place and the true temple. Let me say it again, it is his death and resurrection that constitute him as the true temple and the true meeting place of God with men. So John may have told us in chapter one, verse 14, he may have clued us in that Jesus is the temple. But now Jesus takes it a step further. It is not just Jesus, his person, who is the meeting place with God and men. It's more than that. Glorious as he is in his eternal person, that's not the point. It is not just Jesus in his incarnation that is the meeting place of God with men. It is Jesus in his death and resurrection that constitute him the meeting place of God with men. Here is where we meet with God. Here is where sinners can come and meet with God, and that is not in the old temple, 
the old tabernacle, through the priesthoods, through those sacrifices. No, Jesus is the true meeting place of God with men, and what constitutes him that is his death and resurrection. Destroy this body, and in th this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He does not say, destroy this body. He does not say, I am the temple. He does not say, I am the meeting place. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. It is his death and resurrection that constitute him as the meeting place of God with men. This is a theme that is picked up in a huge way throughout the New Testament. I would love to expound it in, at length in Hebrews chapters 9 and 10. You can jot it down if you would like. I'll just make reference to it. Where the writer there in Hebrews 9 tells us that the great lesson of the Old Testament tabernacle, the great lesson of the old temple, was that of the unapproachableness of God the unapproachableness of God. It is a notion that is almost entirely lost among us today, that God is unapproachable. He's the creator. You are the creature. He is holy. You are a sinner. You have no right into his presence. And Hebrews 9 and 10 tells us at some length that the point of the Old Testament tabernacle is to teach us that lesson. You wanted to meet with God, you go to the temple. But of course you can't go in. Priests have to go in and do the work. And not even just the priest, there's the high priest. Only he can go into that holy of holies beyond the curtain. And in fact he can only go there once a year you'd been a Gentile and you wandered into the community of Israel, you'd have known in a, in a minute that you, you're at a distance. You're not one of these people. There are all kinds of things about them that make, make you feel that you're not one of them. And it make you feel honestly that they have an access to God that you don't have. You could proselyte, you could become one of them, and you could get closer. But still, you would not have access to God. If you wanted to go to God, you have to go to the temple and you have to go to the priest. And then there has to be sacrifice that's acceptable to God as according to his prescriptions. And then once a year, the high priest could make appropriate sacrifice. And once a year, he could go in beyond that curtain and sp sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat and there enter God's presence. But everything about that system said, you can't go in. You can't go. Stay back. You have no right. Stay back. There has to be a priest. You stay back. In Hebrews chapter 9, and verse 8, we read, By all of this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place was not yet opened. The way into the presence of God was not yet available. The whole system screams, stay back. You can't go. And now Jesus takes all of that and he says all of that was prospective. And it all pointed to me. You want to go meet with God? You go to the temple. I'm that temple. You want to meet with God? There has to be a priest. I'm that priest. You want to meet with God? There has to be an acceptable sacrifice. I am that acceptable sacrifice. Destroy this body. In three days I will raise it up. And he is telling us that only by his destroyed and risen body that we can meet with God. And it's in that sense then he's alluding to himself as the temple. By virtue of what he accomplished in his death, he is the way of access to God. Again, the synoptic writers pick up on this, one of the great miracles of Calvary. The moment of Jesus' death. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that curtain separating the holy place from the most holy place, torn from top to bottom. Through Jesus crucified, we have a way in. Hebrews chapter 10 refers to 
Jesus refers to that curtain and says the curtain which was his flesh. And all throughout we are shown what Jesus is saying here. The way to access to God is through the crucified and risen Christ. Not just Jesus, glorious as he is, and his eternal person, but it is Jesus, crucified and risen, that gives us access into the presence of God. You can't come any other way. God won't have you. You have no right. Stay back. The only way you can get to him is through the crucified and risen Christ. This in turn opens up what is a huge theme in the New Testament, and that is the theme of access, a great big word in the New Testament, access. It's precisely what you didn't have in that Old Testament system of worship. You had to go to the temple, you had to be a priest, you had to be a sacrificed high priest, and once a year, you didn't have access. But now through Christ, we have access. Through Christ, we have fellowship with God. Why? Because in Christ crucified, we have one who has taken the place of sinners and he's borne the curse of sin in place of the sinner. And God raised him from the dead in testimony that he has accepted his sacrifice once and for all. And now through Jesus, we can have access to God. The whole ground of our acceptance before God is Christ crucified. Don't think ever it is anything else. Someone asks, how do you think it is that God will accept you? When you bow to your, your head to pray, why is it you think God will hear you? We have no answer except to say, Jesus Christ stood in my place and he bore the curse of my sin and God raised him from the dead. That's my way in. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Destroy this body and in three days I'll raise it up. And in that sense, he has become the true meeting place of God with men. This is why the Apostle Paul tells us we glory in nothing else and we dare not glory in anything else. The cross of Jesus Christ. If you have not come to Christ in faith, then what you need to know is that you have no access to God. You have no acceptance before him. You are not good enough. What you need is an acceptable sacrifice that is offered and accepted then by God. And so Jesus destroyed and risen body. It is indeed the sign of his authority. And this, in turn, is a huge theme in the Gospel of John as well. Christ's death as the moment of his glory, his hour, the hour in which he is glorified, the hour in which he establishes his kingdom, the hour in which he reigns. Ironically, it is in his great display of weakness and death that he reigns from the cross, securing sinners for himself and bringing them into his own kingdom. There, his authority is established. And there his kingship is established. And there is our entrance into the presence of God. And so Jesus was not suggesting that they should physically destroy that building, the temple. And he did not, as they later accused him at his trial, he did not threaten to tear it down. But in a very real sense, and this is one of the marvelous themes of the Old Testament, in a very real sense, Jesus did destroy that temple. Because of what use is a temple erected for the purpose of sacrifice once the great sacrifice has been offered? When Jesus died, that old temple died with him. When he died, that old temple was in a very literal way destroyed. In his death, he spelled the end of that old system of worship was just prospective in the first place. And he 
establishes himself as the way into God's presence. There's only one temple. There's only one meeting place with God, and that is the crucified and risen Christ. And that is just the simple gospel. If you would have fellowship with God, here's how you go. Not claiming any of your own merits, not claiming that there's a prettier way or an easier way or something that you can demonstrate. There is one way. Through that sacrifice that has been offered and whom God has confirmed in raising from the dead. Jesus is the true temple. We dare not approach any other way. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, oh, how grateful we are for the Lord Jesus Christ. What great things you have accomplished for us in him. What a glory it is for us to come into your presence, to bow our heads in prayer and know that you accept us, you welcome us into your presence. And the whole ground of our acceptance has nothing to do with us. It is what the Lord Jesus has done in our place. We glory in him and we praise you for him. Father, if there are any here today who don't know Christ in a saving way, Lord, open hearts today that we, we, we may all rejoice together in him. We pray in his name. Amen.